theyeshiva.net. We begin the fifth chapter of the Rambam's Hilchis Deis, the laws of character development and ethics. After the first four chapters of Hilchis Deis, the first three chapters were dedicated to teach a Jew how to live, how to develop our characteristics, work on ourselves, work on our, on our temperaments, ultimately striving to follow that path which he calls the Derech Hashem, that centered, balanced path, the path of synthesis, of harmony, of integration, in which we become, so to speak, imitations or reflections of divine wisdom, love, and compassion and sanctity in this world. And in the fourth chapter, the Rambam went on to articulate an intricate regimen of our daily schedule and our diet and our behavior and engagement with most of the physical dimensions of life, especially eating and drinking and sleeping and intimacy and relieving ourselves, etc. Now, in the fifth chapter, the Rambam discusses how this Jew, who this Chacham, this wise Jew, who truly becomes a living embodiment of Torah values, how this person's life is manifested in different aspects of life, which the Rambam is going to begin to address. Let's see. Perik Hamishi. Aleph. Kishem Shachachem Nikr Bechachmasu Bedei Yosef Umuvdol Ben Misharaam. Just as the wise man the person who has internalized Torah values, is recognizable in his wisdom, and he's recognizable in his temperament, in his character traits, and he often stands apart in these areas from the rest of the people. In the same way, this wisdom must be recognized in his actions, in his activities. And the Rambam now lists ten words to define the actions in which Chachma must be recognized. Interesting, the number ten. B'machaloi in his eating, b'mashkeyo in his drinking, b'bilasay in his physical intimacy, b'asiyas trachim in the way he goes to the bathroom, b'diburi the way he speaks, b'iluchi the way he walks, b'malbushi the way he dresses, b'chil kol dvarov the way he manages his things, his finances, or b'masoyu b'matanei and in his business dealings. And what the Rambam is saying is that Torah is not an intellectual pursuit alone. It's not only something that relates to one's inner mental or emotional or spiritual characteristics and temperament, but rather, when the Torah is really internalized, when it becomes, so to speak, my DNA, then every aspect of my life, even the most physical, mundane, external dimensions of my life become an expression of that chachma, of that spiritual consciousness of wisdom, just like my wisdom, my learning, my inner emotional life becomes an expression of that consciousness, Every aspect, the way I eat, the way I drink, intimacy, and even going to the bathroom and dress and walk, and all of the fasts the Rambam discussed all become a living manifestation of this awareness, of this consciousness, of this higher state of oneness with reality, with infinity that the Chacham lives by. And a classic example for this would actually be DNA. The body is very compartmentalized. But when it comes to the genetic code, to the genome, to the DNA code here, you find it in the brain, but you'll also find it in a toenail. And you'll also find it in a strand of hair. Why? Because on a DNA level, every single aspect of our organism is a manifestation of that genetic code. When the Torah becomes my DNA, then there's nothing that's excluded from it. Every single facet of my life, even the smallest, mundane, most physical thing, is also an expression of the authenticity and the depth of Torah. And all of these activities should be truly beautiful and befitting and becoming to the sage. Ketzat. What do we mean? Now here you're going to get a glimpse into the Rambam's systematic mind. He just enumerated, he gave 10 words in which you're going to recognize the Chacham, right? Eating and drinking and intimacy and relieving himself and speaking and... Uh, walking and dressing and managing his affairs and Masoi and Matone, which are relationships and business dealings with other people. Now, the Rambam is going to elaborate on each one of these facets that he discussed in this order. So this halacha and the next halacha is going to be talking about eating. Then he's going to be talking about drinking. Then he's going to be talking about physical intimacy. Then he's going to be talking about uh, relieving himself. Then he's going to be talking about talk, uh, communication and then walking and dressing, etc. So watch the organization and the systemization here. The Rambam just enumerated briefly all those aspects of life where you see the Chacham, and now he begins to elaborate on each one. Kate said, what do we mean? Talmud Chacham. Talmud Chacham is a student of a Chacham, which represents the Torah sage. Lo yi should not be a glutton. 
He eats foods that are appropriate to make the body healthy. That's what he eats. He eats foods to make his body healthy because there's a focus. I eat to live. I don't live to eat. And even those good healthy foods, he will not overeat. He will not stuff his system. He will not pursue and run to go fill his belly. Like those people who fill themselves, who stuff themselves with food and drinks to the point that their belly bursts. For these types of people, there is an explicit posik in Nevi'im. The Nevi'im, the writings of the prophets, or Ksuvim, are called Kabbalah because it's the traditions that were received from the prophets. V'zeirisi, this is a posik in Malachi, Perig Beis, the last Navi. V'zeirisi peresh al pneichem, peresh chagechem. I will spread excrement on your face, the excrement of your holidays. On a literal level, the Navi, the prophet, is telling the Jewish people that when their holidays are observed without righteousness, without moral sensitivity, it's just about a frivolous party, Hashem says... It's excrement. Oh, but Amru Chachamim, the sages gave the following interpretation. These are people, they party their whole life, they just eat and drink gluttons, and all their years are just one long holiday and festival and feast and party. In other words, there's no higher consciousness, there's no deeper consciousness. These are the people who say, just eat and drink because tomorrow we die anyway, so why not just have a good time? In other words, they focus only on the short term, um, uh, instant gratification, that which is going to satisfy me right now. The Chachim is the antithesis of this. He eats foods that will make him healthy and he never overeats and doesn't want to stuff himself because there's a purpose. The food is being used as a tool so that the body should be wholesome and healthy and sound to be able to live a life that is aligned with the essence of reality which is the creator of the world. Unlike those whose entire focus are those things that ultimately turn into excrement in a few minutes or a few hours. This is the type of food, the type of feasting of the wicked, of those who are weak, those who fail to live up to the human potential. And these types of tables, these types of parties, are disgraced by the Pasuk in Yeshaya, Chavches. It says all these tables are filled with vomit and excrement, Bli Makan. Without Makan, Makan is one of the descriptive names of Hashem who constitutes the space of the world. In other words, these are places that are devoid, consciously devoid of the divine presence in reality. The wise man, somebody who eats one dish, he may eat two dishes, he eats enough that which he needs in order to live. That's the purpose of the food, and that's enough. Shlaima says about this person in Mishlei chapter 13, the righteous person eats for one purpose, to satiate his soul. This is in terms of what he eats and how he eats. In other words, what types of food and the quantity of those foods. I don't overstuff myself. I'm not a glutton. I don't want my belly to burst. The purpose is to be healthy. Now we talk about location. Location, location, location. There's also a way of eating and the place of eating. When the wise person eats this amount of food, this small quantity, which is appropriate for health, not gluttonously, not overstuffing himself, which is not healthy. Where does he eat it? He eats it at his home, at his table. He should not eat in a store or in a marketplace unless it's of utmost necessity because it's a shameful act in front of people. This person who becomes an embodiment of the values of divinity, of Hashem, of Torah, should not be eating in the store or in the marketplace. Nor should he eat by people who are not very scrupulous in ethics and values of Torah and mitzvahs or tables that are filled with the above-mentioned vomit and excrement. In other words, he should eat in environments that are conducive for deeper connections, for authenticity, for moral integrity. But generally, even with sages, he should not eat frequently meals in many places. Shouldn't eat at meals where there's a huge gathering of people. It's generally not appropriate for him to eat from others unless it's a meal of a mitzvah, which is a sacred meal. A meal of betrothing, a betrothal, or a meal of marriage. The wedding itself should have the character of holiness and sensitivity and morality of a Talmud Chacham who marries the daughter of a Talmud Chacham. 
In other words, a home, a marriage that is based and saturated with the values of refinement, morality of Torah. The old righteous, the righteous ones and the pious ones of yore would not eat from a meal that was not their own. Gimel. We finished eating. The Chacham is manifested in how he eats. The way a person eats, you can see the Chachma, you can see the wisdom, you can see the holiness, you can see the refinement of Torah. We now go to the second step, which is drinking. The Rambam continues, When the wise man drinks, He drinks only to soften the food in his system. The Somebody who gets drunk, He's a sinner. It's repulsive. And he loses his wisdom. And if he becomes inebriated and intoxicated before, which are those who are more ignorant and not so scrupulous in Yiddishkeit, it's actually a desecration of Hashem because this is a person who has come to embody and personify the values of Yiddishkeit. And when he becomes a drunkard, it's a, it's, it's a desecration of God. Not let to drink wine in the afternoon. Even a little bit. Because drinking, which is part of the food, part of the meal, will not make him drunk. The main caution is about drinking wine after the meal. But if drinking wine is part of the meal in the afternoon, that's not a problem. So, he discussed eating and he discussed drinking. What was the third step, you remember? Where do you see a chachem? You see him? In physical relations, halacha dalat. Even though the wife of a person is always permitted to him, as long as, as long as it's not in the menstrual cycle, which we'll learn about later in Rambam. But generally speaking, a husband and a wife can always be together. It's appropriate for the Talmud Chachem, for the Torah sage, to behave in a uniquely sanctified way. And he should not be found with his wife like a rooster, which is basically a euphemism for somebody who's overindulgent in physical relationships, but rather from Friday night to Friday night, if he has the stamina. He's together with her. When he's together with her, it shouldn't be in the beginning of the night when he's satiated and his stomach is full, nor should it be at the end of the night when he's hungry, but rather it should be midnight when the food has already been digested in his intestines, but he's not yet hungry. That's the appropriate time, the Rambam says, the best time for intimacy. He should not be very lightheaded. And he says, very lightheaded. Because the point here is that a relationship, as he's going to explain, requires a certain element of vulnerability and excitement and free-spiritedness and joy. Yet, because he's a Talmud Chachem, he's careful that everything ultimately is permeated with a sense of refinement because he is essentially a refined person and therefore he will not be very lightheaded. Nor will he um, desecrate his mouth with obscene words even when it's privately between him and her. And again, we're talking about a relationship that by nature is extremely vulnerable and people have to feel that they can be extremely open. But because this person is truly refined, the Torah has permeated the very fiber of his being. That's what the Rambam is describing here. So therefore, it's manifested everywhere. So the way he eats, the way he drinks, and the way he engages during physical intimacy, the way he communicates with his wife then, will also have a certain refined element. We say in Kabbalah, Kabbalah again is the Navi, the Navi Amos tells us, chapter 4, he tells the person his conversation, Our sages said, even a light conversation between a husband and a wife, you're accountable for. In other words, the Talmud Chacham realizes the power of every word that I can utter. Every word that comes out of my mouth has meaning, it has significance, it has purpose. God listens. I'm accountable for it. And therefore, even in such vulnerable, exciting, and joyous moments of intimacy, you will not hear obscene language. Both of them should not be drunk during intimacy, nor lazy, nor depressed, miserable, sad. And not even one of them. Nor should she be asleep. Never will he coerce her and she doesn't want. Intimacy is done with the mutual consent of both of them and both of them in a state of simcha, in a state of positivity and optimism and joy. He first communicates with her and he laughs with her a little bit. 
In other words, they have an enjoyable time together so that her soul should be relaxed. Listen to the Rambam's words. You can't just engage in physical relationships. The Rambam says she first has to be relaxed. She has to be in a state of calmness and serenity and tranquility. So he does whatever it takes. He tells stories. He communicates with her. They have what we would call yisachik. There's a kvelling. There's laughter. There's fun excitement. So she should be relaxed. She should feel settled, settled and calm in her skin. And then he engages in a relationship with a certain sense of shyness, a certain sense of humility, not with aggression and chutzpah and audacity. There's an element of respect, of refinement, not with azus, which is you know, aggressive chutzpah, the yirfish meyad, and he separates right away. Hey, kol hamoyeg minigza, somebody who follows this custom, loydai loy shekidish nav shevetir atzmoy, v'tikin de yosov, not only did he sanctify his soul, and he purified himself, and he rectified his character traits, eloshim hoyu loy bonim, iyu noyim ubaishonim, ruuyim lechachmo lechzidus. If from this relationship come children, these children are going to be beautiful, they will have busha, they will have sensitivity and respect, and they will be worthy of wisdom and of piety. Their souls and bodies will be conduits for piety and for wisdom. And those who follow the customs and the traditions and the routines of the masses who often walk in darkness, they walk in darkness, he will have children like that. Vav. Of course, as it says in Svarim, the Arizal explains this, Tanya chapter 2, a father and mother cannot determine the nature of the soul of the child. That comes, that Hashem decides. But nonetheless, our behavior, our consciousness, our, our modes of behavior, our habits, the nature of our relationship, and as the Rambam says, our communication with each other and our state of mind and heart does have an effect on the fetus. Vav, we discussed how a chacham eats, we discussed how he drinks, we discussed how he has physical relationships. Now, we go to the next step, which is going to the bathroom. Tamidei chachamim are exceedingly modest. They do not desecrate themselves, they do not expose their head or their body. Remember, in those days, it was only a midas chassidus, it was a pious behavior to always walk around with a yamaka on your head. But he says the Tamid chacham will make sure that his head should never be uncovered, nor the rest of his body. Even when he goes into the latch, even when he goes into the bathroom, he is modest and he will not remove his clothes until he sits down. If he's using his hand, his hands to wipe himself, he will not use his right hand to wipe himself. He will also distance himself from every person and go into a chamber beyond the chamber or a cave beyond the cave and only then will he move his bowels. If he's doing it on back of a fence, he's going to distance himself enough that if another person on the other side of the fence will not hear his sound if he's making sounds. If he's going down in a valley and that's where he's going to the bathroom and leaving himself, he will distance himself enough that his friend should not see his nakedness. He shall not speak while he is moving his bowels, even if it is of important necessity, he must wait till he finishes. Just as he behaves modestly during the day when he's in the bathroom, the same is true also at night, even when it's dark. Generally, if a person can, he should try to train his body to defecate in the morning and in the evening so that he should not have to distance himself from civilization so far, because during the day, there are so many people everywhere, and because of his modesty, he's going to have to go far, far away. But if he trains himself to go to the bathroom early morning before sunrise and in the evening, then people are in their homes, and then he doesn't have to go so far away. So, the Rambam discussed how a Chachem eats, the Rambam discussed how a Chachem drinks, the Rambam discussed how a Chachem engages in physical relations, and how he relieves himself. Now we go to the next one, which is Bidi Burai, how we see the Chachma in verbal communication. Halacha Zayin. Talmud Chachem lo yeit soyek v'tseveich b'shaz di burik behemez v'chayis. Listen to his words. A Talmud Chachem should not scream and yell and shout and holler while he speaks like animals and beasts. V'layag biya koyla biyoyse. He should generally not raise his voice to high pitches. He speaks with pleasantness and serenity when he communicates with anybody, with any living creature. On the other extreme, when he speaks quietly and pleasantly, he shouldn't start whispering, through which he appears like an arrogant, pompous person. You know, sometimes people who are better than everybody else in their own mind, they think they're aristocratic, to speak normally, they whisper. So everybody has to come very close to hear every word. The Rambam says that Hamad Chacham does not do that either. 
he will greet every single person. He will say hi and bring shalom, greet everybody, everybody. Powerful words, because he has a mission. His mission is, he wants their spirit to be comfortable with him. In other words, the Talmud Chacham knows, part of my mission in life is, I am an ambassador of love. I am an ambassador of light. I am an ambassador of compassion. I want to empower people. I want to bring out the best in people. I want to bring love to the world, kindness to the world, holiness to the world, purity to the world, light to the world. And therefore, he greets every single person, no exception. Every person he greets warmly. He says, Shalom to them. Why? He wants them to be inspired from him. My role is to inspire people, to bring out the best in people, to bring out the goodness in people. I want to be a source of inspiration for all of these people. The don is kaladam lakafschos. He judges every single person meritoriously. He speaks about the praises of his friend and never about his disgrace or shame. The Talmud Chacham has one mission statement, one agenda in life to bring out the best in people, the light in people, the infinity and the holiness in people. He loves peace and pursues peace. If he sees that his words are effective and being listened to, he will say them. And if not, he also knows how to be quiet. That's also part of knowing how to communicate, how not to communicate. For example, he will not appease his friend when the person is furious and angry. It's useless. You may be saying the right words, but it's useless. Fascinating. Sometimes somebody makes a vow. They're very angry. I'm never going to my mother-in-law's house again. We have something called Hataras Nadar. Hataras Nadar means you go to a sage, and the sage says, if you would have known that when you make this vow, these and these would be the ramifications, would you still make it? You say no, so they could nullify the vow. Don't ask him questions then to try to nullify the vow, because in a moment of anger, he can ultimately say, no, I'm still holding on to the vow. I don't care about any possibilities. And then what happens? You close the door for him. He can't nullify his vow. Wait till he relaxes. Wait till he calms down. Nor should you offer words of solace and comfort when the corpse is right in front of him because he's overwhelmed. You may be saying nice things, but it's not the time. The person is startled. The person is in a state of, of shock. It's a very, very difficult state. You have to know when to be quiet. Show up. Be there. But it's not the time for you to start offering words of comfort. The kol knows when to speak and how to speak and when to put a zipper on his mouth. He will not show up in front of his friend when his friend did something very shameful. He doesn't want to embarrass him. He stays away. He never changes his words. He never lies. He won't exaggerate. He won't uh, diminish from the truth. Unless if it is to make peace. If the goal is to promote peace between people, then the Talmud Chachem may alter his words. He won't lie. But he will exaggerate. He may not say all of the details for one purpose if it is to make shalom, if to make peace. Here's the cardinal, here's the principle. Talmud Chachem only speaks words of wisdom and words of kindness and love and generosity. He should not converse with a woman in the marketplace, even if it's his wife or his sister or his daughter, because not everybody may be aware of that, and it is a boundary that he is very sensitive not to cross, so there should not be any wrong impressions. Yes. We spoke about how he eats, how he drinks, how he has relations, how he relieves himself, and how he communicates. Now we go to the next step, how he walks. Yes. A Talmud Chacham never walks with a... Uh, Erect with an outstretched neck, like in this arrogant fashion. Like the Pesach says in Yeshayi, V'telachna netuyo yizgoro in umesakrois einoyim. The Pesach tells us in Yeshayi 16, and they walked with necks outstretched and flashing eyes. V'lo yahalich okev b'tzad gudel benachas. Nor should he walk his, uh, his, okev um, b'tzad gudel is, uh, he should not walk with a short-stepped toe to heel. Toe to heel. Like women tend to walk and some male people who are arrogant, you know, they walk very what's called statechna. The toe 
is touching the heel. The heel of one le- of one foot is touching the toe of the other foot, step by step. So he says, there's two extreme. He the, 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 the shouldn't walk with an outstretched neck, erect, like, you know, I own the world, I'm the dictator of the world, or in this fashion, which can also come across as very condescending and arrogant. Kinyan Shenemar, like the Pasuk also says in Yeshaya, another Pasuk, Halech v'tot, Walking and mincing as they go, tinkling with their feet. He shouldn't run in the public streets like a madman. That's the opposite extreme. Nor should he bend over like a hunchback. In other words, you're telling the Talmud Chacham, don't walk in a way that seems condescending and pompous and narcissistic and arrogant. You know, with this upright, uh, upright stature, and you're erect and stretched out neck, or so slowly, you know, you're, 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 you're. I keep on missing the word. Your toe is touching your heel, so he'll go to the other extreme. You know, he'll be, he'll behave like a hunchback. You know, he's going like this. That's also not the proper way to walk. He looks downward, like when he's by davening. Like the way he's by davening. He walks in the marketplace like somebody who's busy with business dealings. In other words, he's not idle. He's not frivolous. He walks with a certain sense of, of seriousness, of responsibility. From the way a person walks, you can see if he's wise, if he's a person of perceptiveness, or he's a fool. And mindless. Shlema says in his wisdom, Kaihelis chapter 10. The way a fool walks, he tells everybody that he's a fool. You can see that he's a fool. And now the Ramam goes to the next step, which is dress. The dress of a Talmud Chachem is Malbush Nov and Naki. It's fine, it's beautiful, and it's clean. It's forbidden that on his clothes there should be a stain, a stain of blood or a stain of fat or another stain. On the other hand, he shouldn't dress with royal aristocratic garments that are very flashy. Clothes of gold or purple that attracts everybody's comments and eyes. Nor should he dress in, the, in, in rags of very poor people, which is embarrassing for the person who wears these garments. He should dress ordinary, nice, fine clothes. You shouldn't be able to see his skin from under the clothes like the very light linen that they make and they produce in Egypt. Nor should his cloaks, his garments, schlep and drag on the ground like arrogant people. Rather, they should reach till his feet. Till his the sole of his feet, and the sleeves should reach till the fingers. Nor should he uh, undo his cloak. That again, it drags on the ground. You know, it's very long. Again, it appears like it's arrogant. Unless Shabbos, if he doesn't have another garment in which to which to put on in honor of Shabbos, so then he can take the cloak that he wears all week and he uh, he lets it uh, he lets it drag on the ground. How do they translate? He lets his cloak hang down on Shabbos just to honor the holy day of Shabbos. He shouldn't wear shoes with patches on patches on patches. It's embarrassing in the summer months. In the rainy months, when there's a lot of mud, you won't see the patches. So if he's poor and he has no other choice, that's fine. You shouldn't go out with perfume to the market or with clothes that are perfumed or put perfume in his hair. Unless... He put it in his flesh in order to remove dirt. That's fine. He also shouldn't walk alone at night unless there was a permanent time when he was going out to teach or to learn so everybody knows the reason why he's walking at night. But if it's not for that purpose and it's not that time, it could just arouse suspicion. Remember in those days, nighttime came there was no uh, forms of electricity that we have today, and therefore people were home. So if he's walking out at night, it can arouse suspicion, and that's the reason also why he shouldn't go out with perfume, unless it is to remove dirt. The Rambam continues, he discussed the Talmud, the Talmud Chachim eats and drinks and has physical relations and relieves himself and communicates and walks and dresses, and now he goes to the next step, Halacha Tess, which is Kilkul Dvar, of managing his finances. Talmud Chachem Echalkul Dvar of A Talmud Chachem manages his finances with thoughtfulness, with justice. 
he gives to drink, he feeds, and he gives to drink, and he nurtures, and he nourishes, and he feeds his family according to the money that he has, according to the means, and according to the success that he has. He does not overburden himself and engage in unnecessary expenses that will make his life miserable. Our sages commanded us when it comes to worldly affairs, don't just always eat meat because you have to eat meat. No, when you really, it's a, it's a special delicacy. When you really want it, okay, so then buy yourself meat. The Torah says in practice, when your soul desires to eat meat, don't just take it for granted and do it because you have to eat the best foods, it just becomes routine. No, when you have a special desire, it's a special thing, it's a special treat. It's fine for a healthy person to eat meat once a week on Friday night. If you're, if you're wealthy, so you can eat meat every day, that's fine. The sages said, A person should always eat a little less than what is appropriate according to his means. He should dress exactly according to his means, but he should give his wife and children and respect them even more than his means. It doesn't mean he should go into debt, as the Ramam said before, he doesn't overburden himself, but it means be sensitive and respectful of your wife and children, and you can give them a little more than your means, and you'll make it work. You're out. So, the Rambam discussed eating and drinking, and the Rambam discussed afterwards, you remember, physical intimacy, and he discussed relieving yourself, and he discussed how you speak, and how you walk, and how you dress, and how you manage your finances, and the Rambam now continues managing, about managing finances. Yud Aleph, Derech Balei Deya. It is the pattern of thoughtful people, of people who follow logic. That there should be an order in life. First, Find a source of livelihood which will support you. Then purchase a home to live in. And then get married. Shanemar. The source for this is in Parshat Shaftim. When Jews went to war and the police officers got up and they said that certain individuals are exonerated from going to battle. They can go home and they can help the battle efforts in different ways, not by being mobilized to the front lines. So here are the words from the Parshat. Who was a person who planted a vineyard and did not redeem it on money because the first three years you couldn't eat the fruits. The fourth year, you took the fruits and brought them to Jerusalem or you redeemed them on money. You brought the money to Yerushalayim and you ate food over there. Whoever planted a vineyard and four years did not pass yet. Who is a person who built a new home and never had a chance to dedicate it and move in? Who is a person who betrothed the woman but he did not take her, meaning they never moved into one home and began living as a couple because they used to wait 12 months between marriage, between betrothal, and then the marriage ceremony when they actually started to live together. All these people are exonerated from going to battle. They can go back home because of their unique situation. What do we see from here? There's an order, right? Vineyard, source of livelihood. House, now you have a house. Now you have a woman. You can get married. I will have tips the fools. Maschilim lisa isha. V'achikachim the fools do the opposite. First they get married. Then if he finds the means, he's going to go buy a house. And then at the end of his life, he decides, you know what? I need some parnos. He's going to start looking for a trade. Or if not, he'll just support himself from charity. We see this in the curses in Parshas Kisove. It says, First, you'll betroth the woman, you'll build a home, and you'll plant a vineyard. In other words, the order of your actions will be reversed, not an appropriate order. You know why? So you won't be successful. So that's why it says, first you'll get married, then you'll build a home, and then you're going to find a source of livelihood. That's not a way to do it. But when it comes to blessing, the Pasuk tells us in Shmuel Aleph Yudches, by he David l'chol drach of maskil v'ashem imay. David followed all of his, all the ways of his life followed Seichel, they followed mindfulness, and Hashem is, was with him. Yud Beis. V'asur lo'i adam lahafkir, lahaktish. Oh, great question somebody asked. Very famous question. The Rambam gave the order of the Pesukim, but that's not the case. First it speaks about a home, and then it speaks about a vineyard, and then it speaks about a woman. How can the Rambam do this? This created a lot of discussion in the Mepharshim. You can look in the Kesef, Mish, Lechem, Mish, all the Mepharshim are Rambam. Some say that the Rambam primarily meant that marriage is the last one. The fact that you need a livelihood before you build a home is obvious. How are you going to buy yourself a house or build yourself a house if you don't have money? So obviously you first need to earn an income in order to get a house unless somebody's going to buy it for you. But the main point is that marriage comes at the end. So you have an income and you have a house and then you marry. That's what some commentators say. However, others bring out a very interesting point. The Pasuk says, Chilol, 
is when you redeem the fruits on money, you bring the money to your shan, that happens on the fourth year. So this is somebody who planted his vineyard three years ago, but four years did not pass yet. And then it says he built his home. Now, hopefully it doesn't take so many years to build a house. So that means the planting of the vineyard actually came first. It's just four years didn't pass. And then he built his home. In other words, he did start securing for himself a source of livelihood. It's forbidden for a person to make all of his assets ownerless or to sanctify everything, to get, dedicate everything to the base Hamikdash. And now he himself becomes a beggar. It's not the right way to live. Also, you have to know how to manage your finances. Don't sell a field which is a source of income and also is not easily destructible. You can't burn a field to buy a house. Don't sell a house which is real estate in order to buy movable properties because a house is a long-term investment. Don't sell your house to take the money and start doing business with this money. Sell movable items in order to buy a field. The principle is this. The Rambam's business advice. Your ambition should be to be successful, that your assets, your money should become prosperous, and exchange the impermanent with the permanent. In other words, invest the impermanent with that which will be a long-term per- permanent source of income and revenue. Remember, your intention should not be just temporary gratification for the moment or to beautify yourself so everyone, ah, ha, ha, you're, it's very, you're living a very attractive and high-level first-class life, but ultimately you are losing your money. Finally, the Rambam comes to the last aspect where we see the Chachma manifested in daily actions the last one was Masoy Umatone business dealings. Halachi Yud Gimel. Fascinating, fascinating halach. Zok de Ramba. Masoy Umatone Shal Talmud Chacham Be'emes Be'emunah. All the business negotiations and, a Talmud, and dealings of a Talmud Chacham are always done with integrity and trustworthiness. Oymed al halav lav al hein hein. When it's no, he says no. And when it's yes, he says yes. Meaning, it's not that he says yes and he means no. And he says no and he means yes. No, when he says no, it's because it's no and yes is yes. He's honest. Every word is honest. When it comes to himself, he's very meticulous to pay back the, every last penny. When it comes to other people, he can forgo. He can forgo. If he buys something from them, he'll forgo a little bit. He won't be so medactic on them. He pays for what he buys right away. If he can, he doesn't take it on credit. He tries to pay up. There are three things he tries to avoid. Becoming an Ariv, which means a guarantor. When somebody borrows money from somebody and I say, if he doesn't pay you back, I will be the guarantor. Or a Kablan, which means I take initial responsibility for the loan. Or Harsha means I become an agent of somebody else to collect money from a third person. All these things, I'm getting into potential conflict. Of course, if it's a serious situation and you can help somebody and save somebody's lives, he does it. But in other words, he avoids every possible conflict where he gets in between two people and at some point there may be contention there and he tries to avoid all forms of contention. When it comes to business transactions, he will hold himself liable even in a case where the Torah does not hold him liable because he never wants to go back on his word. So for example, if I tell you I'm going to buy this, even though we did not sign a contract, there was no legal transaction and acquisition that the Torah would tell me, I have to continue this, but the Talmud Chacham is so scrupulous with his words and therefore he will hold himself accountable even if legally he can get away with it. He will never go into another person's trade. In other words, something that may take away somebody else's partner. So even if he could find a loophole, that's what he will not do. He will never do that. And the Rambam concludes the last words about Atal Chacham. Maybe it sums it all up. Throughout his entire life, he will make sure not to cause distress to another person. Here is the summation and the principle. He shall be from those who are pursued, but he will never pursue. He will never persecute. He may be humiliated, but he will never stoop down and humiliate others. A person who behaves and engages in all of these types of activities and similar activities, on this person, the Pasuk says in Yeshaya, Perik Mantes, he said to me, Avdi Ata, you are my servant, Yisrael Asher Becha Espar, a Jew in whom I am glorified. He becomes the human being whose very presence 
is a glorification of Hashem. This concludes the fifth chapter of Hilchistayis. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.